Hi everyone, I'm Luke Hector and you're watching The Broken Meeple. This is a YouTube channel about board games where I give reviews, top tens and my honest opinions regardless of the consequences. We'll get on with the show in just a minute, but first a quick word from my sponsor. As a fellow gamer, you'll understand this is unacceptable. The solution? Head down to my new sponsor, Kiender.co.uk. Kiender stocks many of the hot new releases as well as some old hidden gems. Free delivery on orders over £30, further discounts on bulk purchases, and even 5% of your spending refunded back to you as points to be used for further discounts down the line. If you use the referral link in the description below and sign up for a new account, you'll get 5% discount on your first order over £60. So let's make gaps in your collection a thing of the past. Get down to Kiender and start saving today. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the video. Get on with it. So we're already part way into July, which means we are done with half of 2023. Where has the time gone is what other people like to say. And to be fair, it has been quite a quick six months. Although, can we speed a little bit quicker through the summer, please? And then it can cool down and I can get back to temperatures I like. Not to mention that we've got Essen in October, Midgard in September, multiple conventions in September and October, Gridcon in November. You know what, can we just get to those months already? I'm kind of like, I'm good with, Yeah, you know, I was saying that, I got a couple of good things in July and the golden anniversary for my parents in August. Yeah, you know what, maybe we can just let time go at its own pace. But we're here to talk about games and here specifically I am giving a first six month review of 2023. So I'm gonna talk about 10 games, not in tons of detail, but basically I just wanna go over some best of 2023 so far, worst of 23 so far, disappointments and surprises. And I've got five from both the good and the bad sides, not five from each category, five good, five bad. And I just want to give my thoughts as to how the year has been going generally. I mean, it's one a couple of caveats with this. Firstly, I've not played every single game from the first half of 2023. But then again, neither have you. Everybody got that? Neither has anybody. It's just, it's physically impossible to do so, especially when some of them are hard to find Kickstarters or games that may have just not necessarily interested me or maybe the UK hasn't even seen it yet. The other caveat is that not a lot of stuff tends to get released in the first half of 23. You know, you get some games, but the majority of them tend to happen around Gen Con, Essen, end of the year time period. It's definitely a seasonal trend. So there's only so many games that are noteworthy to talk about and there's probably some games that I just haven't got played because they either haven't arrived or they're due or I've got them to review but I haven't had a chance to play them. I've got Bamboo, Mall Peak for that example, Scythe Expeditions has still not arrived on my doorstep despite the fact several people in my area have got the game. If I didn't know any better I swear mine got delayed just so I couldn't give a critical review of it. That <laughs> wouldn't surprise me. But on top of that there's also uh, Kickstarters that have not arrived like Deep Rock Galactic still has not arrived. I've seen people in the UK get it. Where's my copy of Deep Rock Galactic? You know I want to play that. So there's plenty more stuff to come in the second half of the year but I just want to go over 10 games of this one so let's start with surprises and disappointments and we'll start on the good note all right start good we're going to go with surprises of 23 and the first one I want to mention is station fall station fall from I think it was ion game design this is a big sci-fi game which is a bit chaotic a bit random in places and certainly all over the shop in terms of just how many mechanics you've got to kind of remember for this game. It's certainly a bit of a slog to teach, but essentially it's this kind of amusing game where you play, you, you take a hidden role of one of multiple characters that are on this spaceship that's plummeting, plummeting to the earth, it's going to blow up. And some of them you want to get off the ship, some of them you don't, but they've all got special abilities that you know, they do whether it's like, you know, an android that likes to, res you know, to help people medically, somebody who has to, you know, a chimp who can go through air ducts, uh, you know, certain people who can go out into space because they've got jetpacks, you know, there's, there's all sorts of weird stuff there, even up to the point where you've got like a, a gun drone that likes to, you know, you know, likes to break its programming. You've got a little bot that says that before you get to go to Earth, you have to sign a subpoena law firm. You've got another character who carries, like, essentially the plant from the big shop of horrors around and likes to eat people. There's all sorts of weird, crazy stuff. But you have a hidden role, and with this hidden role, you place influence discs on these characters to make them move around the ship. And you're trying to complete objectives based on the hidden role that you are, but you can reveal which role you are and unlock some other abilities at any stage during the game. So it's chaotic, it's meant to be played with a light-hearted tone, and it's certainly not to be taken too seriously, and the game can go on quite a while at times. But this one surprised me as to, despite the fact that it has those things that I should be going, oh, that's a red flag, and oh, these are problems, 
I still really enjoyed this game, but I feel like this is a game I have to play with my friends. And that's pretty much the only scenario I have played it. With my friends, my friend has this Kickstarter and we play his copy all the time. And this is pretty much the way I want to do it. This isn't one that I would want to play at a convention with random people I've never met before. I think that camarader camaraderie, whatever, with the, the, the meta that builds up in this game, I think is more important than in other titles. But it does have still those issues. I mean, the game does go on a while. It is a slog to teach. There's a bucket load of rules you've got to remember, little side rules. The characters do feel that there's a balance issue with some of them, but it's not the end of the world. And also, you can get into a situation where you feel like you are just screwed and there's no way that you're going to win this game, but you kind of kind of got to go for the motions. And in some cases, almost kind of kingmake people because you know you're not going to win, but your turn could screw over somebody. Who do you screw over? It's, it's definitely not a perfect designed game, but it's a fun game. It's, it was one I think I would give an 8 out of 10. I think it's a really good fun game, but you got to play it in the right circumstances. you got to maybe cap the player count at five or six tops and you know when you play it with four players I think it's a really good you know system and you got to be careful which characters you use because you can create some really imbalanced scenarios if you're not careful but it's cool to decide whether I want to go release Project X or you know get out of this escape pod thank god there are plenty of escape pods we won't have to dress up like women and children it's got some weird, wacky moments. It's playing tropes to various sci-fi movies, and it's cool to spot the Easter eggs. It's a nice little surprise. You know, it's not the cheapest game in the world, and I don't recommend it for everybody. But if you want a kind of light-hearted, funny, sort of kind of sci-fi, tropey game, this is one to maybe have a look into. Uh, next one, uh, surprises. I'm going to talk about... Well, I've only got two surprises. The next surprise is Books of Time. This is from Born in Dice. I reviewed it recently. Go check out that video. And this one, I was a little bit hesitant going in because, as I mentioned on the video, recent Born in Dice games that have come out, like Terracotta Army, Origins, Tamanusi, and all that, I've been less than stellar about. They've had very average reviews for me. I've pointed out a lot of criticisms I have, and I was afraid that ever since the start when Board and Dice brought out stuff like Teotihuacan and Tekenu and that, they were starting to go a little bit downhill with, like, hmm, we're not innovating here, we're just re rinsing the same old stuff and these aren't as good. So I went into this with lower expectations, but the the what they thought was a gimmick, it's not a gimmick, the cool thing with the books that you build up almost like a deck builder intrigued me. And when I played it, I was surprised to find that this one is actually a very enjoyable engine builder, deck engine deck builder. But the deck building is not like just shuffle a bunch of cards into a deck. You create the three books you've got in front of you. So you choose when the pages go in and what order they go in. You decide whether to trigger the abilities on these pages, not just waiting to draw the cards out of a deck. And it is a straight up dry engine builder. I mean, there is no theme in this game whatsoever. There is no player interaction. You might as well just play it solo, but it's got a pretty neat solo mode. And honestly, that's pretty much the way I'll play it 90% of the time. It's just a nice, easy solo mode to pilot and you get to do this cool combo engine builder with the free books. It's a very satisfying game to play and well produced, especially with those book binders. A lot of people were commenting that it's like, oh, I don't know if I want to hear the clickety clack all the time, or I'm worried that these books will break in no time i mean fair enough if the noise irritates you there's not a lot i can do about that but these books are still in good quality after i've used it plenty enough times to get it played for a review and then some afterwards yeah these book binders are gonna last it's not a problem the components are not a gimmick they are well done especially for the price point of the game but yeah this felt like a nice change of pace for board and dice like they're kind of going in a different direction now is barcelona their newest one basically going back to the old school the game is still really solid, good, dry as a bone, pretty much solo only, but it's a very satisfying one. And one that I think is innovative in the fact that it takes a genre that is familiar and does something new with it, which I'm always willing to praise because not enough games are doing it. Books of Time was a genuine surprise. All right, let's flip it on its head now and go to disappointments. Disappointments. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this one in too much detail because this one, I've already talked about it on two videos. I talked about it on my best of June. I've also talked about it on a podcast. But I will say that Inventions by Vital Asserter, 
Um, and one other caveat with this, I'm not going to talk about games that I've previewed or only played in their development stage. Unconscious Mind was still in development, Kings of Ruin, Tainted Grey was still in development. Inventions was a finished product though, so I can talk about that one. And I've already talked about it loads, so I'm not going to belabor it here, but the, it basically, it feels like another Lacerda. But not in a good way, it just feels like another Euro. Like this is another game with a bunch of mechanics and the kitchen sink thrown in, very dry, the theme here barely comes out at all. I mean, if you thought Weather Machine had barely any theme, this one is a whole new level of the no theme whatsoever. And it just feels kind of bland and looks bland. I mean, it's got Eon Tool's artwork on it, but Eon Tool does functional, great graphic design, not beautiful artwork. So the yeah, the board just is like an array of beige and brown. The card stuff you do isn't that interesting. You don't get to chain those extra actions that often as you would like. And then you've also got this end game scoring thing where you put the tiles that you acquire on this grid in front of you, but 75% of the time, it doesn't matter how you place them. There's like the occasional scoring tile that says, put them in a row of three or have these connect to each other. Why thematically? There is no reason. It, there is no theme in that aspect whatsoever. You know, you could do some really cool stuff with inventions as a theme setting or with the card flips, but really all the inventions basically mean is that if you have a card in the early day that say iron, you might find one later on that says smelting and you need to know iron. I mean, that's basically it. Yeah, you know, the rest of it is just a run of the mill Euro game, which is fine. It plays fine, but compared to some of the stuff like Kanban and Gallerist and that, which are like you know, 10 out of 10s for me, like these are really fantastic little sort of games with good theme and good cool mechanics. This one just felt like, hmm, I'm running out of ideas here, but I need to put out another game each year, so you know what, let's shove this one out. This one didn't feel like it really deserves the attention it's getting, but as I say, there are people who disagree and that's fine, but this one is not the Lacerda I'll be chasing anytime soon. I'm sticking with these four. So let's have a look at, say my phone has powered off in the distance here, which is basically what I'm using as my reference guide. Okay, what do we got there? So another disappointment, oh yeah, we got two here. After Us, After Us, I've done a review for this as well, check out that video. After Us was getting a lot of hype at the Games Expo, not just because of a unique title cover by uh, Vincent Dutre, but its artwork was making it look good. Small game, card game, this idea that you're, you know, who cares about the ape theme? A monkey! But the idea that you were placing cards in a row every turn, trying to link up the boxes to gain resources and spend them to do victory points. I mean, it's, I mean, imagine if you took some of the elements of Res Arcana and you just changed the mechanic. That's basically what this game is. It's a straight up dry engine builder like we've seen before, just with an interesting little card gimmick. That bit is fun and I do enjoy that, but you can play this with up to six players and it means sod all that you should do that. Not as in, not as solo as uh, Books of Time, it ain't far off. You, know, you have a little token that you flip and you can buy a bonus of other people. That's literally it. Other than that, there is no reason to have other players there. So you play it solo. The problem is, is that the AI is not only fiddly the pilot, but it's also friggin' difficult. You have to micromanage its resources to stop it buying cards, and even then it's not gonna, you know, it's gonna gain points way faster than you likely will. I've seen some people quote scores on Twitter saying, oh yeah, I beat it and I only had 44 points by the end of the game. I'm convinced you didn't play the game right and you got the rules wrong, frankly. The AI should have a lot more than 40 points by the time you get to 80. It just seems very punishingly hard and also very swingy. I mean, the only way you're gonna be able to mitigate the AI's resources is luck of the draw with the cards you get. So I don't necessarily feel like I'm playing the AI, more as like the game is playing me and I'm just seeing what the AI does. But this game was just, uh, it was fine, but it was only above average. And I was hoping that this game would be a lot better. I was hoping this would be like, oh, I can get five or six of us and a cool little interactive engine builder, that'd be great. No interaction, the engine building is fine, but very lucky. And it just, uh, the artwork is not good enough to sell a game. Just because it looks gorgeous doesn't mean it's going to be fun to play as well. And this one is not a bad game. I would play it again, maybe with a cap of three players. But yeah, this one just was a disappointment. Given how hyped it was at Games Expo, how everybody was trying to grab one of the limited copies, this is instantly going on my sell pile because I just don't really feel the need to play it again. And the last disappointment is a game which I'm sure loads of people are going to disagree with here, but I don't care, that's what I do. Distilled. A lot of people are really hyping this game up, well not hyping, buzzing, you know, it's been released, it's had its plays, and there have been some positive reviews for it. For me, this was a bit of a disappointment too though. The idea that you're 
you know, making alcohol and doing all this stuff was great. And the theme, cool. It even represents it in the deck building element of it. That's the slight problem though, because you have this element where you're brewing the drink, but you have to take these ingredients you've got and you do something called whatever, well, top and tail or whatever it's called. But basically you remove two cards from the mix and then you use what's left. That in itself is random, and this is not a short game. This is a two hour plus Euro game where you've got this random element that can screw you over by dumb luck. You mitigate it by putting more stuff in that deck so that you can, you know, hopefully not draw out those ingredients, but you can't always do that, and you may just have the worst luck anyway. You might buy a card that says every time this falls out of your deck, you get a cool bonus, but then will it ever fall out of the deck? It's entirely random. But you're trying to make these drinks, and you've only got seven rounds in the game. If you fail to make the drink you're doing, particularly if it's your signature one or a high point value drink, I don't care if I get a few bucks from making moonshine. What I've lost by not getting one of those drinks is significantly worse than the fact that I get a couple of coins. So if people overtake and get an early lead because of good luck, you're unlikely to catch them up. The game also, you know, is produced well, but man, the text on the cards is way too small. I'm trying to read these cards in the display for like the upgrades you get and everything else. And even, even if I put my glasses on, which I don't desperately need, I've got 20-20 vision, this is mainly for VDU use and concentration. But, you know, even with these on or something, I'm having to really narrow down and squint to look at the table at those cards because the text is way too small. Graphic design is not the forefront of this game, definitely. And, you know, I just kind of felt like it went on quite long, it dragged, the downtime was quite high between turns, and it just, uh, for all the hype it was getting, for everybody wanting to play this and saying, oh, this is amazing, I played it and found bits of it fun, but, you know, there were bits of it that were just really irking me, and I thought, what, this is it? Like, this is, this is the thing that everybody's going mad for? I'm hearing other dissenting opinions about it as well, so I'm not the only person who wasn't a fan of it, but... Yeah, I was kind of expecting more from this, and I just felt like, it's fine, I guess, but would I want to play it again? Probably not, unless I was only playing it two-player, because frankly, I think it just goes on too long for what it is, despite the fact that it's only got seven rounds, it seems to drag on a lot for each round, and that luck element, as thematic as it is, does get in the way sometimes by sort of ruining your game when you don't want it to happen. It's, I don't know, it's, it's... It's got some problems that I would put it on a disappointment list. Not worst game, I would maybe play it again, but yeah, I don't quite see the, the big, you know, overflowing uh, buzz for this. So, okay, let's move on to, uh, uh, should we do best or worst? Uh, let's do worst. Let's carry on the uh, negative. Maybe I should have started with disappointment, so I don't know. Let's carry on the negative front, though, and do my two games I would consider to be the worst games I've played. Now... I am going to step it like this. By worst, I mean that I would rate these a 5 out of 10. That still is average. That doesn't mean the game is bad. Because honestly, one thing I will say about 2023 is that we've not had a lot of bad games, like terrible games this year. I feel like we've done pretty well on that front, which is a good start. But then, of course, more stuff to come out later in the year. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. But yeah, these two games I rate 5 out of 10. They're average, but... It's not that I was expecting more and I got disappointed. These were, mm, uh, okay, I'll play them and oh yeah, this isn't particularly great. First one is Beast. I'm not gonna talk too much about it because I've gone on, I've mentioned it in the podcast and the best of June, sorry, the played games of June, not best of, but Beast just turned out to be a bit of a meh game. It's a typical trope of a Kickstarter by a new company where some more time in the oven was needed to develop the game. It's all V1, it's meant to be hidden movement, except it's not hidden movement because you spend 90% of the game revealed on the map as the Beast because it's so easy for the hunters to find you. It's more like, it's more like a chase like you're chasing me around the board and it's like yeah but i wanted the hidden movement factor what's the point of stealth if if you upgrade the seer character he's broken beyond belief and can find you instantly and then you've got the upgrade system where certain players will never get any upgrades for the game and if they do that means their character basically sucks for the game it just it's got some problems oh yeah bad rule book didn't like the rule book it's a long teach it's a very long game because all you got to do is have the players communicate between each other to say you know oh we're gonna do this or i think he's there or something and you're just sat there as the beast going get on with it you know it's it can drag out i just think that this needed more time so 
I had some expectations for this because I thought the theme and concept sounded great. And I do like the drafting card mechanic where you're drafting cards between both teams, which is quite cool with the dual cards. Although why did we need the whole play red and blue to play two cards at a time? That's just another mechanic that could have been removed. You know, streamline, streamline your games. We don't need every mechanic in the kitchen sink in these games. Just because people buzz like crazy over revive does not mean every game needs to have 20 mechanics in it. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Streamline your game, particularly if it's gonna be a fairly long affair to set up and play. But yeah, I've talked about it on other episodes, so by all means, check that out. Uh, the next one I would consider to be the worst game I played. Still, I'd give it a five, maybe a four. I wasn't a big fan of this one, and that was Darwin's Journey, which I know is going to really infuriate some people. I'll give you a piece of sh who love everything that this designer puts out. He's not one of my favorite designers, I'm going to say that now, but this one just felt boring. You know, not necessarily bad, but boring. There's nothing in this game that's a unique selling point. It's another Euro. It's another Euro from this designer. It feels like one of his games. The Darwin theme is overused now, like loads of games are coming out with Darwin themes. Seriously, did it just suddenly become mainstream? Did copyright you know, fall off it this year? Because everything's all got to be about Darwin, but there's no real Darwin theme in this. You get to sail a boat and go on these islands, whatever. It's just move up tracks, it's tracks. You grab a few tiles and you shove them on this grid. Why does it matter where you put them on the grid? I don't know, mechanics. The only thing that's even remotely kind of interesting is the whole what spaces you like the worker placement side of what actions you select with the idea that you can upgrade yourself to go on better versions of those actions. But even then you have to kind of focus on that in order to actually have the resources and availability to be able to afford that because it's pretty expensive to do it. And sometimes you draw some of those unique ones that are different each game and you look at them and you go, they're not particularly interesting actions or ones I want to do. And then they just get left the whole game. The ship action, boring, because you know, with the others, you're actually getting bonuses and doing stuff. But the ship action, you literally just go, done. You have to do it because you need to unlock other islands and get more people and not lose negative points. But it's a boring action. You know, I'm only doing it so I don't get screwed on victory points. The game is forcing me to do a boring action because it's unnecessarily punishing me and it just needs to throw in a reason to do it. Otherwise, why would you bother? It, the game's just not that fun. It's another generic one. It kind of gave me the same feeling as say, come on, no, this is gonna get me a lot of hate, Carnegie. He's biting me, he's biting me, the is biting me. You know, I prefer Carnegie to this one. Carnegie has some cool stuff about it, but I would I don't want to play Carnegie with more than two players. I think with three or four, it's just too chaotic. And again, Carnegie to me just feels like another Euro. You know, there's very few unique selling points in that one. It rehashes stuff like Ticket to Ride connection mechanics, which is like, why is that a thing in this game? It just isn't what, you know, I play it and I go, it exists, it's another Euro. This is the same sort of deal, it just exists, it's another Euro, but this one I actually found more boring. I, you know, this is not a game I want to return to. I hear the expansions make it better, but again, I shouldn't need expansions to fix your game, and even then, from what I've heard of what the expansions do, I don't think it's really gonna add to the fun factor, it just gives a bit more variety. There's much better Euro games I'd rather play, especially even dry Euro games. Pulsar 2849 and a few of these other dry Euros that I enjoy. I'd rather play them over this one. It's long, it's a fiddly teach, uh, you yeah, know, the rule book's not perfect, but I wasn't reading it too much, uh, you know, but it was hard to reference information. Yeah, this one is probably one of the worst games I've played this year, but again, it's not bad. I just found it dull. Dull, dull, dull. We're sorry. And hopefully I've not lost some of you by saying that I didn't like Carnegie and Darwin's Journey, and probably Distilled, I suspect that's got its fans, but why don't we talk about some best ofs, okay? Three best of the years. First up, I want to talk about Isle of Trains All Aboard, but I have done a full review. In fact, I've done a full review of all three of these games, so I'll try not to go in too much detail, but Isle of Trains All Aboard, very, you know, surprised how much I did like it, but I thought it was one of the better games I've played this year. Card game from Dranda Games. It's an engine builder, both figuratively and literally. You are building your train out of cards, but it uses the San Juan thing of 
The deck of cards is everything. It's the engines you build, it's the currency you use to make those engines, and it's the cargo you load onto those engines. All done with a clever hand management system. I love that mechanic in games. More games need to try it. San Juan has a similar deal with the, the resources and the buildings and the currency being all that deck of cards. Well here, same deal. You only have two actions around. They're super quick. Uh, they're super simple, although Despite a couple of good reference cards, there are a few little side rules that you've got to be aware of which aren't on the reference cards. So maybe a little BGG reference aid would be good for somebody who could just highlight those little bits. That niggle aside, it's a very neat, compact card game that packs more depth into it than you would think from its small box cover. It's a cool hand management system, scores are very tight, you're scoring something like 25 to 35 points in a game, and every point matters. You can have an... Even if you trigger the end of the game, it doesn't necessarily mean you've won. I've lost games that I finished first in. It's just a neat, clever little game that's not complicated, but, you know, and even though it's got a train theme, whatever, it could be any theme, but it works here, and I love the mechanic in it where when you load cargo and passengers, if you load them onto other people's trains, you get a cool bonus, but they have the cargo and the passenger to work with. So you've got to do a little balance of, well, how much do I want that bonus, and how much do I want to give them something that may allow them to get victory points? It's a cool mechanic and just a clever little card game. I gave it a 9 out of 10 on the review. Check out the video for more details as to why. What are you waiting for? A kiss goodbye? Next up I want to talk about what probably is my second favorite game of the year. I mean it could tout with the, the one and two could go back and forth but this is probably my second favorite game of the year and this is one of the most innovative asymmetrical games I've ever played. It's not even a theme that I would normally go near. A, a social political theme? This is the theme that's getting me this year, but I can't knock it. It's a brilliant, clever design. It is asymmetrical roles, which normally means a long teach, and it is a long teach, but you get players who know what they're doing in this game. Like when you play this with four experienced players, wow, does this create a good dichotomy of meta and you know banter and interaction. This is interaction in the Euro done right, and that is hegemony. Hegemony, uh, whatever the tagline is, who cares? But this one really wowed me. I mean, I've still got the game. It is right there, right there with the expansions and stuff. I like playing it solo with the AI that comes in the expansion, the simple AI, not the complex AI. But this one is just a really fun game. And it's not one that I'm gonna play often because it is big, grandiose, and there's a lot of rules to remember. But at conventions, I see people wanting to bring it out and I'm like, can I join in? You know, that'd be cool. I've got a lot of people I know from conventions who own this game. I've taught this game at GridCon in the past, you know, to various people. They've enjoyed it. They've grabbed their own copies. They've kickstarted it. And I was just really shocked by how much I enjoy this. Playing one of the different classes, working middle class and state and capitalist, each with their own style of play, but still similarities to other classes and everything going on on the board with what companies are open, what jobs are available, how the policies are with the laws and stuff, which are really important, do not ignore those. All of that is interactive and everybody is influencing that this, this sort of board state which impacts every other player. There is no multiplayer solitaire in this at all. This is a 100% interactive game. Not like, not too much of the whole take that thing, but just the fact that, look, I want to augment this policy to have low wages. That's gonna tick off the capitalist. Might tick off the state, but they might be all right. Middle class, they're not certain. They may do, they may not want to, but the working class I'm playing at the time, I want low wages and we're gonna force this through. Help, help, I'm being repressed, bloody peasant. It's just really clever. I can't go into too much detail here, but check out my long review. I did a, br I did, sorry, I was about to say brilliant review. Uh, ego much? No, um, I did a fairly long review on this game, I've gone into a lot of detail over it. Seriously, check out that video if you wanna know more, but yeah, Hegemony, if you want a big three hour plus Euro with asymmetrical roles, heavy, will burn your brain, this is not for everybody, but if you're into this kind of thing, you really do need to check it out or have someone teach you it. Although ideally, watch Paul Grogan's um, uh, video first, you know, his playthrough video and learn it that way because, uh, it would help if you knew the rules before I try to teach you it. And then the last one I need to mention for best of the year is, ah uh, yes, there you are, right there. I mean, this could go hand in hand with my uh, hegemony at the time, but I think for ease of play, the fun I have with it, the fun quick solo mode, and the fact that I can play it on Board Game Arena really easily, Earth. Earth is a great, 
fantastic game. I mean, people are saying, oh, it replaces Ark Nova and a few of these other games. No, 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 no. If it replaces anything, it replaces Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition, because I think that the similarities in that are pretty similar to that. And Ares Expedition I had problems with, I would never really want to play that game again, as long as Earth exists. But even though it's got some scoring similarities to Wingspan, both games do play differently. And it's definitely got a lot of differences to Ark Nova. You know, the whole, when I saw the Dice Tower a lot do their games that replaced other games, and Mike and that were saying, oh yeah, well, Earth has replaced Ark Nova, and it's like, what? kind of planet are you on? But your weak link is, this is Earth. <laughs> that thinks that Ark Nova is that similar to Earth, but, ah well, their choices, their lists. Certainly, I don't agree, Ark Nova, love. But Earth is just a really cool tableau building combo game. You know, you are playing all these different floor cards, you are drawing a ton of cards with all these options, it's very tactical. You can have some strategies in place, like, oh, I found this terrain, that lets me score for this, I should probably work towards that. You've got the milestones and the personal objectives that you can go, all right, well, I should aim for that, I should aim for that. So you have some strategies, but then you just draw all these cards and you go, oh, if I play that, I can draw that combo. If I play that, that will go nicely with that. I can put that next to that flower, which means I can put more trees on these. You've got different resources that you get, like sprout cubes and that, that can be spent as currency. You've got the simultaneous actions, which means you are constantly engaged in the game. Yes, there's a little bit of downtime when you've got slow players who take forever to trigger all their actions. That can get annoying <laughs> fast, and I have seen that happen. But if you've got experienced players with this, you are just constantly engaged as the simultaneous turns will keep you active for what it is you're doing with minimal downtime. But even then, I'll just play the solo mode. The rule book is not great at explaining the solo mode. You might want to take a little bit of time with it, or maybe ask on Board Game Geek or ask around for rule qualifications on certain but. But once you know what you're doing, the solo mode is an easy one to pilot and it's a good challenging mode, but it lets me do all that cool combo building. It's just a case of make certain you don't give the AI too many points and try and beat the AI. It's a really solid game. I love it. It's produced well. I haven't even sleeved the cards. I mean, there's too many cards to sleeve, frankly, apart from, apart from the starting islands and uh, climates and ecosystems. I have sleeved those. But I'm not sleeving the normal player cards because there's just so many of them. And if you tried to stack that many, it would just flop over everywhere. And honestly, the cards still hold up even after all the plays it's had. I just don't feel it's necessary to sleeve them. But yeah, love this game. It's fantastic. Check out my review for more details. I did it in the beginning of April, I believe. But this is easily, I think, my favorite game of the year alongside Hegemony. And Isle of Trains, I think, is definitely my third favorite. But yeah, Hegemony and Earth could switch places every now and again, depending on what I played. But I think probably I would give the edge to Earth just for its ease of play and it's easier to bring to the table. Really solid game. You gotta check it out. So there you go, that's my roundup of 2023. So far, no bad or terrible games. I mean, I'd say Darwin's Journey and Beast are my worst games I've played, but they're still five out of tens at worst, a four out of 10. I don't consider them terrible or bad, you know, so the year has done all right by giving me a lot of games that I can go, these are decent or really good, but there is a little bit of a lack of innovation in places, and I would like to see more risks taken with some of these new games. But the second year, second half of the year is where things will really pick up with game releases. So there's certainly plenty more on the horizon, and with the ones that I've got to review and you know, do and review in the next month or so, there could be some pretty big swings in terms of high enjoyment or high you know, hatred. So we'll have to see on that front. But yeah, so far, not a bad start to the year. You know, it's not terrible. I've got more faith in this year, I would say, than probably last year and a year before. But, uh, you know, the stuff I'm looking forward to later in the year, with, like, Unconscious Mind hopefully re releasing properly, uh, you know, the next Tainted Grail update, as I mentioned before, uh, the expansion to Ark Nova. I didn't talk about expansions on this video, but Ark Nova's Marine World expansion, uh, the Lost Ruins of Arnak expansion. Yeah, those two are auto-buys. But yeah, some cool stuff to come. But so far, hopefully you uh, enjoyed this video. And by all means, thumb it up if you can. That's it for me on this episode. But I'd like to know your comments down below. Do you agree with the placements of these? Are they your best, worst, surprise, disappointment? Uh, which ones fit those categories for you? There's probably games you've played that I haven't. I'd like to know. But then do you, do you agree with the placement? Do you think, oh, this game that I thought was great was rubbish or the other way around? I'm pretty sure most of you have got pretty dissenting opinions when it comes to, uh, you know, how I feel about 
Karate Ki and Distilled and uh, Darwin's Journey compared to the rest of you, but, you know, it's to each their own. We all like different things. But until next time, by all means, check out more content on the show, including the June Roundup and all the other reviews I've been doing. So take care, and remember, regardless of what you think of 2023 so far, there's still only games, and there's more to come. So bye for now, and I'll see you soon.